to host Dr. Rohit Sharma, who is a postdoc in the University of Applied Science and Arts in Switzerland. Uh, Dr. Rohit Sharma completed his PhD from NCRA, EIFR, under the supervision of uh, Professor Divya Oberoi. Uh, in completed in 2018. After that, he moved to uh, after that he moved to Switzerland for the postdoc, uh, and uh, and then uh, he has been working on uh, several topics on solar physics, uh, starting from uh, radio solar astronomy, as well as now he is also looking at uh, X-ray data from the solar orbit. So with that introduction, I would request uh, Dr. Roy to continue, and uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Everybody can hear this. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. So, uh, uh, I mostly sort of like work in uh, solar physics and uh, uh, use uh, basically uh, various uh, various instruments uh, in space and also in radio and also UV uh, basically as much as I could to, to do uh, my work in uh, solar physics that I will be talking about. So, Okay, so in this talk, I will just uh, basically uh, give a flavor of like what do we do in uh, solar radio physics uh, and what where are we at the moment and in future where will we be going in terms of science and also in terms of uh, like instrumentation and uh, general just thinking of a various phenomena related to solar physics. So I'll first begin by just to give you a brief, brief introduction of like what MSC, why do we need that in the solar space? And what uh, then I'll go on to basically uh, say a uh, few words about uh, what we see in radio emissions because radio emission has been very unconventional uh, uh, wavelength to look, uh, to study solar, uh, to study sun. Uh, then I'll, I'll come to the main topic, which is uh, the multi-wavelength observation from sun and how can we use uh, um, radio wavelength and also X-rays to understand uh, various phenomena which we are talking about. Uh, and last, I want to touch, touch upon the topic of like future of uh, heliophysics because things are changing quite rapidly now with new technologies and new advances, new telescopes which are coming up. So the nature of heliophysics that we do now and how do we sort of like uh, where we are sort of headed and how should we actually prepare for what is coming. So I'll first begin by the introduction. So why do we need actually to study solar physics or heliophysics? Heliophysics is general uh, term referred to which is more to refer to the space weather or to interplanetary medium. Solar physics is uh, somewhat uh, close to, no, not close, I mean close to the sun. So firstly, uh, the sun is our closest star as we know, and it forms the reference for uh, for doing stellar physics, so it, it is basically reference for for uh, star stars uh, various uh, various things which you do in stellar physics. So firstly, so you need to understand sun with respect to that because it will be the reference. Secondly, like the it is the largest uh, I mean the closest and the largest plasma body around. So it forms like a plasma laboratory. Uh, so there are various different types of plasma systems which exist on sun. And these systems, you cannot, many of them, you cannot, you know, you cannot create on Earth. You, you know, Earth, you basically have a limited space, spatial space, and scales are, are, are much lower. But in astrophysical objects, and especially Sun, it provides a variety of uh, variety of plasma systems which can be used to study various uh, plasma physics. The third one is the space weather. As we know, uh, Sun is. Uh, the sole source of sort of like a, it influences the space weather. Um, there are charged particles which originate from sun, they travel in the inter interplanetary medium, and that that defines basically the space weather. And on Earth, it has a direct impact, and this is a most consequential uh, uh, reason why we should actually study solar physics and geospheric physics. Because space weather can directly um, damage your uh, uh, human activities in the space. Just like uh, a, a very uh, large photon mass ejection or or solar flare can actually, um, on 30th of March, for example, in 1989, it basically disrupted this particular part of the of the Earth. In the northern Canada, all the great lines were sort of like uh, they got uh, 
spark and everything was sort of black. So this was a blackout which I used to create this for some time. And the Aurora which was created by, for, by this particular thing, it extended till the Florida. Florida is right to the good south of this. So, um, I mean, such kind of, uh, this uh, comes as a catastrophe. So you don't know like when it's going to come, it will just come like this very really. So we do not have a, a, a real sense of uh, this. And, by, and these, these things, uh, the charge particle, they originate from, from sun and we need to then understand how these uh, charge particles that are getting uh, originated and how they are transmitted and uh, what, which one are sort of like, uh, um, you know, important to, for our perspective and which one are not, so such kind of stuff. And then uh, exoplanet uh, studies are also uh, require some understanding of solar energy because exoplanets again are the systems which are integrated systems. So they have a host star and then there are planets. So uh, the relationship we need to understand and Earth and Sun relationship sort of like provides a reference for these, these kind of studies. So that's why you need to understand solar energy. Now, before I move on, I, I just wanted to mention a few, few of the problems which actually exist in solar physics. These are the decadal problems which I used for, for many decades. One is a coronal heating problem. So, coronal heating problem is basically you can define it, just take the uh, temperature profile of the uh, radial temperature profile of some sun. Then the temperature sort of like uh, near the photosphere, it dips and then it increases slightly in the chromosphere. And then it increases by even larger amount by two orders of magnitude in Corona. And this increase is sort of like counterintuitive because all the heating which is taking place is, is, is in the photosphere and below. Like, so if you just assume like a uh, like a hot uh, hot ball of uh, metal, then you expect the temperature to sort of like just create a bundle with increase. So that has been the problem uh, called Corona heating problem. You see marginal increase in the chromosphere also, and the chromosphere uh, is, is is so this this is also a lot of sort of like problem. Why does the temperature starts to increase from uh, chromosphere itself? So it is also to see that there is like a chromospheric heating problem. And there are two hypotheses, namely like an of hypothesis and the heating hypothesis, which try to explain this hypothesis. The second problem is the space weather prediction problem. So we want to predict these particles which are escaping the uh, uh, gravitational bounds of the sun and traveling to the space interplanetary medium. Uh, so what are the sort of like uh, arrival times of these? So how how do, how do these particles sort of like accelerate from their origin to the interplanetary medium? And what is the sort of like trajectory they follow? And what is sort of like arrival time? Um, so this process is also very really not very really well constrained. Because um, uh, the the physics which is which is governing um, the acceleration uh, acceleration process of the, the charged particle is, is sort of like a little little weak. It is very simplistic, and um, a holistic approach is needed. And the and the charged particle uh, sort of like uh, uh, from the coronal holes, for example, like these dark regions which you see these are like coronal holes. They have from them actually uh, fast charged particles uh, sort of like arrive. So there is sort of like a spatial distribution of these uh, uh, charged particle velocity, which uh, we don't understand, right? Why, why fast charged particles actually come from these regions and the slow charged particles come from other. So these are the sort of like uh, two deeper problems that uh, we need to uh, understand for space weather. And the general uh, understanding uh, of, uh, of uh, basically eruptions comes from a fundamental, uh, fundamental process called magnetic resonation. The two magnetic field lines sort of like they they come and uh, they sort of like diffuse and within that diffusive layer the charged particles sort of like get accelerated and two simplistic uh, model which can do that is are presented here like uh, a standard field model where these uh, charged particles uh, the, the the magnetic fields they sort of like come uh, close to each other by some process maybe by uh, by the by magnetic pressure or by the movement of uh, the two points, they can sort of like diffuse. And uh, the charged particles which are present in that, in that particular volume will get accelerated. Uh, and this, this particular process uh, of acceleration is, is precisely a, uh, a, a thing which uh, we want to, uh, which is not very, very interesting. 
So, so these are called the standard models. In the standard model, basically, you have a, a, a plasmoid which is sort of like goes out, and the charged particles sort of like travel also around these loops. And they hit the it the chromosphere, and then where then they hit the chromosphere, they produce a signatures of hard X-ray. So the hard X-ray sort of like comes from the foot points where the charged particles meet the dense uh, chromosphere. While there are particles which actually travel along uh, these field lines and go out along the open magnetic field lines, and in process they can emit the various types of plasma processes. Also, uh, various transmission. So there are lots of transmission mechanisms which can happen. But primarily, the, uh, the the electrons are sort of like tied to these magnetic fields, and when these magnetic fields evolve, they sort of like emit uh, in various ways. So now uh, I'll give a little introduction to the so to just yeah. one clarification the previous uh, uh, cartoon. So you said that hard X rays are concentrated at the foot point right. is because of the electrons hitting the chromosphere. Right. Uh, but then the soft X rays are usually found at the loop top. Right. So, so what what is the mechanism for that? Uh, so that is also bad control, but these soft X rays are produced from low energy uh, electrons. So they sort of so low energy electrons they stop uh, in a short term. Uh, they stop in this shock mm -hmm. and the high energy they can uh, propagate plasma. So if, if uh, the energy is such that the density in the loop itself is enough to stop them, so you will get the emission from this. So you can get the uh, soft X rays from the loop uh, when the hard X rays, which are produced from energetic particles, they sort of like uh, go till the end of the loop. Yeah, so I'll uh, briefly talk about the solar eruption in case you have are familiar about this. Uh, so solar flares, as we know, so there are four types of eruption, which I sort of like uh, uh, compiled here is the solar flares uh, for the mass ejection, jet institutes, and solar wind. Uh, so solar flares, as we know, they are uh, basically uh, the release uh, of uh, the, uh, the huge amount of magnetic field into the corona, and uh, so they provide a light, very uh, bright uh, signature in in, uh, in uh, high energy. Uh, High energy spectral lines, for example, like UV, you see this image is in 171 and so on, and there's lots of uh, heating which is happening here. And based on their sort of like uh, brightness, uh, there are different types of classes which have been defined, like from X class, which are the highest, brightest uh, players to the Q class, which are the intermediate ones. And these are mostly associated with active regions. Active regions are these places where the flux are sort of like emerging, magnetic flux is emerging from the the below and and they can be seen from a wide range of electromagnetic spectrum right from um, if it is very very high then normal is to radio waves so it, it spans like lots of a uh, wide range of electromagnetic spectrum and of course it leads to particle accumulation which affects the space weather photo on the other hand uh, is is much more dynamic that means that there's a large bulk change of magnetic field which is taking place and in this process Many of these magnetic flux is thrown out of the sun and it, it goes into the, uh, the plant medium. And this leads to a sort of like bulk change in the magnetic configuration, which provides like a very complex uh, uh, complex uh, sites for the particle acceleration to take place. So there's a lot of sites which, which develop in this process because the entire process is, is quite complex in the magnetic region. And of course, it, uh, it impacts the space weather. Uh, as the magnetic flux is sort of like traveling outward. And uh, in this process, there is a lot of shocks which have been created, a lot of sites, potential sites for the shocks. Activated. And these shocks are quite prevalent in uh, CMEs, and many of them actually we see detected in the radio waves, which I will talk, talk about. Uh, the third one is the, the jet sensitive So these are uh, relatively smaller uh, energetic, uh, they have a small energy. These are these can be found uh, everywhere. They need, need not be associated with active regions. They can be spread all over. And uh, similar spicules are these uh, these filament type hairy structures, which are sort of like oxidates and very useful for for uh, uh, BF uh, studies uh, uh, on the sun. Now the solar wind. Uh, so solar wind is basically a persistent uh, sort of like persistent release of the Particle, uh, particle injection into the solar corona. This is uh, ubiquitous, it takes place all, all the time. And then, as I said, like there are fast and slow depending on the places where they originate. Uh, and 
Golden hose are not boring because they are stable, but they provide uh, the, the fast solar wind. So we don't, don't know how to understand why the fast solar wind comes. And it also, um, um, uh, like in lots of studies, uh, there have been the excavation theory which can, which can, which, which are little promising candidates for this. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a brief overview of the solar eruption that we have. Now, what do we actually see in the instrumentation? So, uh, from the from the instrumentation point of view, uh, you um, since these um, these eruptions are occurring in a wide wide range of electromagnetic spectrum, uh, you need to basically design those instruments accordingly. For example, gamma ray, X rays, ultraviolet, these are high energy bands. You cannot observe them from star. You really need a spaces observatory to uh, to see them. And so, there, so there are multiple observatories uh, at these high energy things. Optical, more or less, you can you can you can, you can uh, observe from Earth. So there are lots of terrestrial telescopes. While if you go to infrared, again, you need to go uh, at higher heights, um, typically um, to avoid the water vapor content. And uh, so you can actually fly um, your aeroplane high up with these uh, uh, infrared detectors, and then you can measure it. And in radio. Radio uh, pulse atmosphere is, is quite uh, transparent, so you, you receive uh, radio waves on Earth. But at the, the, the atmospheric cutoff, at about, uh, um, let's say, around 30, 30, 20, 30 megahertz, you cannot observe below 20, 30 megahertz with that accurate measurements. So again, you need to go to space to basically measure the low frequency radio waves as opposed to high, high frequency, uh, about 30 megahertz. You can you can easily see. Now, the most used uh, um, instrument in solar physics is the solar dynamic observatory. It provides uh, like a, a range of filters which you can use to study different types of uh, plasma system. So these filters actually capture plasma at different uh, physical parameters like uh, 94 angstrom will capture very hot plasma um, reaching up to like 6 million Kelvin. Uh, uh, temperature. While if you um, if you are observing in CO4, you will be seeing a little bit cooler plasma. So depending on the on the filter, you can actually you want what you want for you can actually view um, the things which you want to which you want to see. So it, it offers a uh, perspective of different windows. And there are many many uh, 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 space-based satellites which are there, and many of some of the satellites like uh, uh, Solar Pro. And uh, the solar orbiter are the first ones to sort of like which are going around the sun, not on the earth orbit. So it has it has the vital piece of information um, of uh, in situ measurements between earth and the sun, which we don't really don't have with other other satellites. So when we talk about the X-ray, um, so in X-ray it's uh, uh, it's not like uh, uh, it's not like UV detectors. The X-ray is a little bit different because uh, X-rays are quite high energy. Building a detector at those high energy is, is a materialistic problem. Uh, but instead, there are techniques um, to basically uh, use X-rays and try to basically make an image based on the Fourier techniques. So X-rays will have like uh, uh, different different slits uh, which would which would measure these. Uh, so if it's a solar flare occurred, uh, it will it would uh, the photons will pass through different uh, different different slits, which are different in their slit widths, and then um, depending, uh, and then there are detectors, uh, and uh, with with with, a, with a different different counts, they will get. Uh, you will try to construct a sort of like a interferometric uh, picture of that, and then uh, you basically superimpose all of them uh, in 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 a in a nice uh, calibration. So you need to have a good calibration to do that. Uh, then you will get different Fourier components, then you basically sum those Fourier components to get an image. So it's a bit like, uh, yes, it's an it's interferometric technique. So there are these uh, different counts you get from diff different uh, uh, splits, and then you do the reconstruction to obtain this image. So it's an indirect way of uh, imaging. So RESI instrument, uh, which is, uh, which slightly sort of like uh, ended its life in 2020, uh, is it was very very instrumental in, in firstly uh, giving us the spectrogram of X rays, very nice good spectrogram, and the images corresponding images. 
So based on the uh, based on this, radio uh, telescopes and, and uh, are are also very similar in technique. So in radio uh, telescope, um, you you basically have a sort of like a response of the antenna, and then you have a source, and you basically measure the signal from that particular source, and the uh, resolution goes as inversely proportional to the diameter of the antenna. So bigger the diameter, better the resolution. But of course, as we know, the meter waves, I mean, radio waves are quite large, the meter waves per centimeter. So you really require very, very large antennas to, to, to get a very fine resolution. So this building like a 100 meter antenna, one kilometer antenna is not possible. So again, you go to the interferometric technique where you basically station uh, different, uh, different uh, antennas into some configurations, and these would measure your Fourier components. And your Fourier components will synthesize in, in Fourier scale. And then you basically invert this to get the brightness distribution. So it's again uh, similar to what I told you about with the uh, RESI uh, instrument. So, so these are sort of like complementary techniques. Uh, so is, is there a reason that they didn't choose a particular uh, shape of configuration like where it is like the P shape? Yeah, or yeah. So the reason, the reason is um, this is which is not relevant for solar observation uh, because these are designed for uh, uh, cosmic sources. So cosmic sources they do not change with time. Uh, so 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 they sort of like just change the position in the sky, and as 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 they change the position in the sky, we sort of like sample them in the Fourier space, so they form these tracks. And then we sort of like fill the Fourier space based on just the rotation of the Earth. So we can we can uh, we can get away by installing two antennas uh, uh, and just uh, tracking the source. That's it. Um, but sun is um, so the, the assumption is the source should not change the time, uh, which is the case for the cosmic sources. But for sun, sun changes over the scale of uh, set seconds. This is the idea. So it's, it changes over this uh, small uh, scale. So that averaging will also average out to interesting features which you should, which we want to study. So yeah. So but uh, yeah. So that's the general design of the integrated telescope. So what are the current best telescopes that we have uh, for the solar observation? So in the high frequency regime from let's say one to 50 gigahertz, we have the Ozla. So this is a solar dedicated telescope, which has uh, around 12, 12 odd antennas. Uh, and then for the uh, for the, this entire band, then we have the LX, which is, uh, both are located in US. Uh, these are, this is heavily subscribed by uh, astronomers. So Getting time on these is 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 is, is, is tough, but this, this one is solar dedicated, so we can like lots of lots of data from Yosa, which we can utilize for our solar solar based research. In the mid frequency band, uh, from in the intermeter waves, we have a uh, Lupin and Manchester Bright Field Array. So these are all the very new generation instruments. They got built last uh, last weekend or last fifteen years, you can say. Uh, and then these provide a very unprecedented, very uh, yeah, unprecedented data uh, of solar uh, solar uh, solar data, which is quite novel. And I will talk about uh, uh, some of the data uh, and the in my next slides. And at uh, low frequency, as I said, is the atmospheric cutoff. You need to go to space, and we have um, the radio antenna spectrometer from the Plasma Solar Probe, the RPS, RPS, and the space view. So this one is older. This one, uh, the, uh, this one is this uh, 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. So basically, this are, these are the best that we have at the moment. And getting sort of like observation from all of them is very tough. So uh, we are sort of like limited by a solar dedicated instruments and so that, that comes up here. So, I mean, right. so here you have mentioned that uh, the solar dedicated telescope. So what do you mean by that? Ah, yes. Is there any configuration like thing? No, no, no. So solar dedicated means it is solely will be used for solar observation. Okay, it will so not use not any other. configuration or no, no. configuration is is fixed for that. Uh, but uh, but uh, the solar dedicated means it will not be used for any astrophysics okay. observation. So preference will be given to solar dedicated. So if we want, we can also use just a thing. If we 
want, you can use it for other research also. Yeah, yeah. You, you can use this as principle. You can use for anything. But the you, you will have to see because um, this will the sun is quite bright in radio. So what what we have to do is we have to put attenuators on, on the on this antenna. So when you put the attenuator, it is very difficult to see other astronomical objects. So that's one limitation. But if your cosmic source is, is quite bright, you can use it to observe the objects. Have you reused for the stellar observation? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe you know, is this possible? Yeah. Maybe today that is called only the radio telescope. No, no, stereo is uh, stereo. stereo and other as instruments as well. have also been used for it has many instruments. Yeah, yeah. Stereo, 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 stereo. I thought you were talking about radio. No, no, I'm talking on this. It's on this case. Yeah, okay, because what do you observe at uh, very low frequencies? Yeah. Uh, here, yeah. Uh, here we observe um, very uh, one of the slides I will come. Uh, we detect interplanetary type three burst. So these are when the when the, these electrons sort of like they really go into the interplanetary medium. Uh, density are quite low, so you you get um, um, radio burst at, at very very low frequency. So that is what mostly we capture. We also capture some white spot, um, but the origins of that is is not very very clear. Yeah, some of the time we come. Um, we, so I'll, I'll go briefly over this telescope because I did most of my work on this in my case in bright field array. So it's a it's basically a uh, interferometer. So uh, it doesn't doesn't look like a antenna, but uh, we, we treat it like antenna because uh, this is actually uh, similar equivalent to antenna. Um, the the beams are combined to sort of electronically form like a, like antenna beams, and there are many many of them uh, actually distributed in Western Australia. Uh, so this observes in the range of 80 to 300 megahertz, so mostly meter waves, uh, and then we have a very good fine resolution of 0.5 seconds uh, for this, and the codes resolution of like three hour minutes, 150 megahertz. So we have the atomic scale. So so it's located in the Western uh, Australia, and why is it located here? Because there are no humans live there. So the human density is like 10 million humans per kilometer, so nobody is there. So no RFI, no interference background, perfect for radio telescopes. All these radio telescopes are located in very, very remote areas. This is what the drone view look like. So you can see these tiles with their pairs, and then there are these deep formers which actually form the beam. And the cables which take the signal through the correlator. What was the size of each structure? Then? So this one is four, uh, four meter by four meter. So it's on its base. <coughs> bush, yeah. So in this uh, complicated the array system, how do you compute the baseline? Just to this point. So in this complicated, yeah. So we basically roughly take the so uh, we take the center of the of each tile and roughly we get the geometric difference. Uh, but um, if you want to do more accurately, then you need to know the mean, uh, the response of entire four four plus by four plus, and then basically compute some kind of centroid uh, of that beam with respect to other beams. So. Yeah, so you will get a more accurate, but I think the, the baseline, which is uh, is quite regular pattern, so uh, the, the just uh, midpoint does work pretty well. So the uh, longest baseline would determine your spatial uh, right, yeah. right? But you have uh, so what if uh, you have more of uh, those patches or less of those uh, uh, setups? So what what does it determine? Uh, like uh, more. So if, if you have more such uh, antennas close by. Right, yeah. Or maybe less number, the yeah. density of those antennas is, is less number. How does it get much? Yeah, so uh, so yeah, so it 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 directly proportional to the sensitivity in every light. So each so um, so the power uh, at the, for which this uh, interferometer is sensitive is determined is determined where which baselines actually are more prevalent in the entire area. So if you have less number of uh, uh, if you have small, small baselines, more small, small baselines, then you will have uh, um, uh, sort of like uh, um, response here uh, will be good for the larger scales. Yeah, so so you will get uh, more sensitivity on the larger scale. Uh, so you will get a uh, um, good uh, amount of uh, good amount of uh, sensitivity. So you can detect fainter features. And that is the strength of angle rays actually, because there are a lot of them. Uh, 
switch are which are small bit size. And so it gives a very very dense UV coverage. And I was coming to that point. This is a UV distribution. So this is Fourier space. You can see it is quite dense in the in the, the, the center. Uh, and this is the denseness actually comes because there are small more number of small bits here. So this is this is critically needed for for uh, for sun because uh, sun uh, if the sun is quite bright. So if you lose out flux here, then uh, your image will not be that great, and it will have lots of lower image temperature. So that's the advantage of MW over let's say other telescopes that we have. But here you mentioned the bandwidth coverage is much uh, lower because it is around 32 gigahertz. Right. So if you use the much wider bandwidth, then the UV yeah. coverage will be much better uh, for this case. So maybe using wider bandwidth yeah. will be helpful for this. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, of course, wider bandwidth will uh, actually will be helpful. But the thing is, um, uh, for Sun, uh, many of these features actually span maybe like 5 megahertz that's the bandwidth. So, we are already in. We have enough bandwidth to actually capture these features, but of course, uh, wider bandwidth will help. Of course, it will be a challenge for the uh, for the instrumentation later because handling wider bandwidth would require a larger time. So we may not get like 0.5 seconds uh, resolution, but if we can, if we want like finer time resolution, then we can actually go for small bandwidth and then do that. So and that's one of the things that we. Have. Yeah, so these are optimized. So, uh, so these are done in the in simulations before. So, when you design a telescope, so you need to know where the antenna should be located, right? And uh, the, the places where antenna should be located should have a sort of like a uh, uh, should have a science driver behind it. So. So you can actually uh, optimize this using simulation. You can put in uh, your interstellar magnification equation there. You can put in your uh, uh, antenna configuration, then try to fiddle with the antenna configuration and then recover what are the sort of UV coverage you get. And then if you optimize, so you can do a, uh, this iterative process and you will end up with a, a nicely, uh, a nicely nice UV coverage like, uh, like this. Which actually um, covers lots of sort of UV space that is required. So yeah, we can do that with the simulation, and people do that when they design. Are there still any interference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are interference. I mean, interference is a problem, but uh, so that's why we go to such uh, such uh, deserted places. But uh, interference, we get inter interference like, uh, for example, there are power cables which are like many, many hundreds hundred, uh, kilometers there. We also get inter uh, interference from, for example, here, what we get uh, is the FM station from Earth. Um, well, the signal is reflected by the moon and then we detect that. So it's so sensitive that it can detect the stations in Earth and then, uh, so that also causes some disorder to be. Uh, but we, we there are procedures to basically handle such low level of environment. Yeah, but as the human uh, population grows and they use a variety of uh, electronic instruments, then things become worse, which is most of the case with other telescopes now. So this is a visually to maps, right? Yeah. So how to maps. minimize it? Maps. Yeah, so you need more points. <laughs> Welcome to the how to minimize it. By yeah, so by basically. Uh, uh, by adding more antennas, so you can do that by adding more antennas. Or if your source is static, then you can use the rotation of Earth. Uh, so this will also create a track. It's like a synthesis uh, telescope, which uh, uh, I'll show now. So the last. Yeah, yeah. Like the, these tracks. So although it's a bit to do antenna, you can, you can do that. But, but the only option. I mean, if you want to do a snapshot imaging, you just add more antennas. That's the that's the one. Yeah. So maybe we'll go quickly now. Uh, so to the radio emission, what what do we actually observe from a radio emission um, from from the sun? So so there are you can broadly distinguish a radio emission from sun uh, into white sun emission and uh, like the like a burst emission. So burst emissions are like a very 
actually one of this file tree type of uh, addition where you the um, uh, the the file partition is quite smooth. And if you if you look uh, at this graph, so this is basically the flux density versus the uh, frequency, and you can see the quiet sun flux and the actively in flux. So active sun flux is, is quite high as compared to quiet sun flux. The quiet sun flux itself across frequency ranges covers a really really large uh, um, flux density value. So there is like a maybe like around six orders of magnitude difference between uh, quiet sun and active sun. So this is a key feature because uh, if some uh, low level activity is happening in radio, you detect it very nicely uh, uh, in, in radio results. So if, if some something is changing, for example, like a very very weak player, which is something which you don't, which cannot absorb in X rays or or even in UV rays, then but you you see that signature in, in radio because of this sun flux. So this is a key point at at low frequency you get a larger flux. Um, also, uh, then there are different types of emission mechanisms. So, depending on the frequency range you're looking, there are different types of emission mechanisms. So, at high frequency, where uh, you are observing more closer to the to the surface, then the magnetic field strengths are quite high. You get emission mechanisms like gyro resonance, uh, While at uh, low frequency, you get uh, uh, plasma emission and change tolerance emission. So these are uh, so it, it, it also covers a wide range uh, in frequency and also in height. So so this is that. So then, uh, why beyond like ten gigahertz, then the emission from active vision and quite sun are all similar for that? That way, the yeah, beyond, beyond ten gigahertz. So is it because again we are moving close to the sun and magnetic? Yes. So so we are going closer to the sun and uh, the measured uh, emission mechanism is thermal emission over there. So you do not observe much plasma emission in high frequency, which which can give rise to such large spots. So it's also the emission mechanism which is part there. So then so one should uh, take these two pictures as, as one <laughs> and we can talk about the frequency. Yeah. And this this image actually shows quite nicely uh, so the low frequency uh, comes from higher corner range while high frequency comes from lower corner range. So at high frequency you recover these photospheric structures. But at the low frequency, it's quite decreases. The, the the radiation is also quite high. You can say uh, so. This is the propagation. Even if you move closer to the sun, the magnetic field strength in quiet sun and active uh, regions are different. No? Yeah. So then you will have this uh, perhaps more uh, zero synchrotron emission. Or... Yeah. So we have uh, the zero synchrotron emission mainly during the flares. Okay. The uh, yeah, from the flares associated with most the active region. Um, yeah. I there are. There are some players which are from the quiet sun region, but there is no gyro synchrotron emission for them. So there is uh, some soft X ray region that are known, but not the uh, gyro synchrotron. So the field strength in active regions and quiet sun is the difference. No? Yeah. When, you, when you move closer, that contrast will be even larger. Yeah, of course. So then you get, there is no emission uh, uh, activity in both. Yeah, so emission distribution changes. For example, like here, you can see. So this is maybe associated with this. So you see a dominant uh, emission, uh, primarily because of the thermal range tolerance. I think there is also gyro resonance. So there is additional effect of gyro resonance, which are related to the magnetic field strength. So so you get a, like a brighter feature here, but if you move away, then you have the brighter. Yeah, what he, he's also pointing it out is that in that plot, right. even if you move closer to the sun, the active region magnetic field strength is much larger than the quiet sun. Right. Then then again, why don't you see uh, a difference beyond ten? Yeah. Why do we see it? Uh, I mean, almost in beyond 10 gigahertz. Beyond 10 gigahertz, it's almost uh, similar because there is um, you 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 basically have the uh, range such as okay from from the emission mechanism. Yeah, on this. yeah I mean uh, that is true, but uh, these are all projective. Um, the now one one thing that I can uh, I I can uh, relate is like the active. Uh, the active sun is actually referred to the to the flare uh, emission. So the flare emission, when uh, it happens above 10 gigahertz, it's mostly um, like a thermal range tolerance um, that we that we see. Uh, thermal gyro uh, resonance, I need to check by the way. But this this plot just does suggest that it is mostly the thermal range tolerance. So both of them will be like a thermal range tolerance, and that's right. why you see a common curve. Yeah, yeah. 
or uh, the, the contrast is so low that you cannot really distinguish between kitchen and veg. And that's why I think if, for example, Nogiyama, uh, Nogiyama if you, you detect really uh, uh, small changes in when the flare happens, you just maybe five times or ten times, let's say, not more than that. Nogiyama goes up to 34 uh, designs. Yeah, 17, 17, 17, yeah, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, because the the the, uh, the heights will be very close to the transition region, planar, the corona. So there it would be just the ops are done better. Yeah. So uh, to cover Meshon, I'll just quickly go over this. Uh, actually, uh, I've mostly talked about this, but uh, if you want to model the thermal range column, then you basically follow the transfer equation, uh, where you can just uh, uh, model uh, with the optical depth source function. And this is uh, you can you can readily compute it for the emission. And uh, this again, I, uh, it gives you the frequency and the temperature here. And uh, there are optical intake and optical intake regimes. So yeah, you, this is really the really consuming heating consuming. Yeah, again, this uh, so this is sort of like the another plot which shows the extent of the. Emission. So if you go to the high frequency, then you recover these features quite nicely and put the features. And at low frequency, you have the you have the diffuse feature coming from the higher up with the corona. And it, it is at at these wavelengths, it's really hard to emit because of the function of ionospheric effect zone. But the the emission is really really diffuse. And these are the ones which would be interesting because for the solar wind study, we need to see like how does the um, Brightness screen changes as a function of uh, as a function of time that we can relate it to some thing which is happening at the solar surface. So now uh, I'll just talk about this radio burst. So radio bursts are are basically uh, brighter solar uh, brighter radio emission from sun, and these uh, uh, are basically characterized from in the, in the frequency time domain. The frequency time depending on the shapes, depending on the Sizes, um, they are sort of like uh, classified into five categories from type one, which are like these uh, small noise drops, which are uh, confined to a couple of uh, 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth. And they have very, very fine structures in them. Uh, type two bursts are sort of like uh, these 15 features over the time scale of uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and these are mostly associated with uh, shock propagation. And Mostly uh, seen during the CME. And when the CME travels, it creates a bow shock and the particles can travel, it's bow shock, and then they travel. Uh, and then they span, they go from low corner to high, to high corner, right, where the densities are high and low. So they span, they go from a high density region to low density region, and that creates drift in this. And uh, there are type 3 bursts, which are also drifting, but they Drift over a very, very uh, uh, small time over the time scales of five to ten seconds. So they are very, very fast drifting features. They are just like the strings. Uh, and then there are type four, type five, which are which are also which are not very common, but uh, they are they are present here, and they can be associated with such a phenomena here. Now this is the gyro synchrotron emission. So so gyro synchrotron emission is 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 uh, really uh, interesting because uh, gyrosynchronous emission we can we can constrain it uh, from its spectrum. So if if a emission is coming from gyrosynchronous emission during the flares, it has a characteristic uh, spectrum. It has a optically thin part. So this is its frequency, uh, and at low frequency it's an optically thin part. So it has this characteristic shape, and this characteristic shape depends on our different uh, um, values of the coronal um, parameters. For example, so this is the accumulation of the uh, of the comparison spectrum, and here there are uh, different parameters that we are varying uh, from if we vary the magnetic field, it sort of like shifts in the frequency, 
vary the uh, north and the electron density, it will again change. And similarly, it depends on many, many, uh, many, many uh, different parameters. Uh, so the interesting point is here is you can actually change uh, the, uh, these parameters and, and determine which of these parameters actually fit your spectrum. And then these parameters would be the constraint for the, uh, or for the, will be the diagnostics for the coronal uh, parameters which are happening. So you can get uh, the diagnostics of uh, various uh, types of parameters very close to the layer site, which is not possible with other, uh, with other uh, types of observation. So this is uh, one advantage of narrow spectrum with the constraint. The other thing is about other type of uh, So here, uh, what is the basic difference between the synchrotron and the gyro synchrotron emission? So here, the spectrum, right. so it is almost similar with the synchrotron emission. And uh, the earlier part is optically thick and then the then it is optically thin. So what is the basic difference? Yeah, so the, the difference comes from the coherency. So if you have if you have the uh, the, um, the the gyro resonance, then the electrons will be sort of like gyrating, but they will produce a, a sort of like a flatter spectrum as compared to gyrosynchrotron, which, which produces a skewed scale. So there is a, a, a difference in the spectrum which they produce. And uh, uh, also the gyrosynchrotron, uh, it can act in a, in a coherent way and incoherent way. So depending on that, so that will be determined by the brightness temperature of the disk. Uh, so if it is coherent, then the brightness temperature can shoot up quite quite high. Uh, but overall, the difference comes from the shape of the uh, spectrum. The spectrum. Uh, and also uh, in the earlier part of the spectrum, so the lower part is basically optically thick. So how do you expect the emission at this very low frequency? So you are showing that uh, 20 megahertz or the 40 megahertz emission. So how do you expect? Right, right. So, so what happens in the optically thick part here, so the spectrum actually goes um, has a negative slope. But at low frequency, there is uh, sort of like a uh, suppression of emission uh, because uh, of the high, high thermal density. So at, at low frequency, at, at low frequency, we get sort of like suppressed, the emission gets suppressed and it has skepticism, slope, which is different by the uh, so it's basically uh, the suppression which which makes this uh, sort of like uh, uh, this particular uh, this particular way. If you if you look at the gyro resonance, then sort of like it's like it's not sort of like go. Yeah. So the plasma emission mechanism. So this is the most uh, prevalent emission mechanism at meter wavelength, uh, and it is quite complex uh, because it starts with a uh, electron beam traveling in a plasma. So firstly, you need to create a electron beam propagating a plasma, and then uh, there would be so the, the the waves which are already present in the plasma will interact with this, uh, this beam, and uh, so they will create the Langmuir waves. So uh, these Langmuir waves can sort of like interact with each other. Uh, if they coalesce, then it, it produces a, uh, a like a radiation at uh, at high uh, harmonic frequencies. If it is sort of like a, a interact with the, the sound wave, then it can create create a emission at the at the fundamental frequency. So, so there are multiple processes here which are involved, and we do not have a good understanding of how does this complex process entirely work from end to end. So we basically use uh, the observation at frequency and then try to compute the uh, the plasma density and then uh, say something about the origin or constrain the height of the the sources. So, but uh, this is uh, this is a sort of like a different field of study. Uh, how does the plasma emission occur? And this occurs mostly in the, in the meter waves and in the, the low frequency, so below one gigahertz, which is quite quite common. Right. So now I'll, I'll come to the, some of the interesting results which have come from the uh, MWA studies. So, so one thing that we find in the in the, in the uh, white sun study of from from the solar data from MWA, which is quite sensitive, is that even during the week, even during the white time, you see a lot of variability which was not known earlier. So, for example, like this is a spectrum uh, from 240 megahertz to 110 megahertz, then you have different different uh, bands. This is time over 
over a period of uh, half an hour, or one hour approximately. And then uh, you see these big features, these big uh, impulsive features. And uh, if you basically subtract these, then you basically unravel a new population of uh, for emission. So these are always present. These uh, emissions are always present. And they sort of like uh, are narrow band and short lived. So they are not, so what we do, what do we know for, uh, uh, about a new feature, which are narrow band, is that uh, these occur uh, impulsively. So these are just uh, like little spikes, which, which happen in frequency and, and time. And this type of things can occur in the plasma emission mechanism. Um, and the why does this occur during the plasma emission mechanism? Because uh, plasma emission mechanisms are coherent. So even if uh, you you basically you tweak, uh, let's say, and move the frequency or then move the, or the electron density by, let's say, 1%, the effect can be like, uh, hundred percent in the in the in the, the, in the emitted uh, emitted radiation. So, so such kind of things uh, we introduced in the plasma emission mechanism. And with MW data, we sort of like constrain these in terms of their uh, frequency and time. And uh, most of these features occur at roughly like two seconds uh, and uh, four megahertz. This type of uh, frequency and time. This actually constrains uh, like a deep variability, which is of the order of one percent, uh, uh, from the quiet sun. So, so solar. So when we say quiet sun, so it is not actually quiet; it has this variability. And this is a, a plus density versus a frequency plot. So here we we constrain the uh, the solar flux. You can see uh, it is sort of like increasing, like all this. So. So now what we can do with these kind of features. So firstly, uh, we want to image them and imaging them is, is, not, is, 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 is not trivial because um, they have, they are on top of a background, which is like a, um, uh, like a million degree Kelvin. And these features are of the order of 1%. So if you do conventional imaging, then detecting this 1% is, is not possible because there are different types of errors which come from the variation. So variation can itself be a 10% or error marks can be itself 10%. So in order to do that, we basically employ a new technique, uh, basically take out this contribution, the static contribution uh, from the visibility subtraction. So in the visibility, we subtract the, subtract the uh, stationary part and we just make a, a secondary impulsive, uh, impulsive data set. And then we uh, basically image the impulse data set, and then we uncover these these changes here. For example, so here's an example of a time series for for six uh, regions, uh, one, two, three, four, which are one, which is like this. And you detect these these uh, these spikes all over, and this particular spike also shows a, a small QTT, so which is of the order of like 20 seconds. So there are periodic uh, possible uh, periodic uh, in uh, like a uh, pulses here. And this one is shows a type three burst actually. So, so there is a lot, sort of like a hidden level of uh, variability which we do not, which which we have not uncovered till now because uh, of the limitations. So in this region too, where we uh, do see the variability in the radio, right? Um. So I mean, did you try to see the um, variability in UV images of the region from where it is coming from? Or? Yeah, I mean, I had a quick glance, but um, I did not do a quantitative analysis for this, but I did not find any any variability there. Okay. So this was quite localized. Um, so so what, what, what sort of region was it? Was it in? Uh, yeah, it was here. Uh, you can do. It's somewhere okay. here. Okay. And actually, uh, so this is a movie which. Yeah, and, and these are closed field lines where they are where you do see uh, these variability, right? So the, yeah. I think there should be some closed field lines. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, the electrons moving back and forth, or what is, what is the reason? Yeah, so so our interpretation for this was uh, uh, like so, firstly, it could be explained maybe by some kind of wave, wave behavior, but we are not sure because wave behavior should be smooth because if if a source is sort of like attached to a field line which is oscillating, so it should give a smooth variation rather than impulsive. So, but we see impulsive behavior, so it, it could be periodic yeah, type of yeah. So that was a little vague interpretation, but this should be studied in detail. And 
here's the image of uh, these uh, these uh, uh, these impulsive features uh, at four frequency I'm showing. You can see that many of them sort of like are are located near the limb to these uh, these features. And I think uh, many of them are not. For example, there are features which are all over the lunar disc. Spatial scale for these uh, features are large, or yeah. So, uh, so uh, with the in the, in the radio, uh, they have uh, not basically resolved these uh, yet because uh, we are limited by the instrumental resolution. Uh, but many of them actually are are extended, but they are less than one percent. Maybe uh, I don't know. I mean, there could be like a instrumental thing. The one percent is is not uh, big enough. But most of them are unresolved. So these are point sources. But they are sort of like all over the all over the sun, and actually, when you when you plot the number, this is what the number distribution look like. It's quite homogeneous uh, at at low frequency and high frequency. You get less 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 of these bursts. And if you if you, if you, if you compare the variability, then there are these spots which are, which pops up, and these are associated with the bright UV UV regions. You would also see some signature of like you know, this limb, limb, uh, limb right texture, but so in the images. So, so, yeah, so overall, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these are quite weak. Uh, these are of the order of, uh, let's say, yeah, less than like 10,000 Kelvin, between 600 to 10,000 Kelvin. That, that's the range in that case. And we can actually, uh, if, we, if we assume that this, this brightness is closely associated with electron beams, then we can actually compute the non thermal energy which is stored in them under certain assumptions, of course. Uh, and when we sort of like do that, then we sort of like uh, we can plot this uh, particular frequency curve. And there, the non thermal energy lies in the range of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 1 hour. So, quite, quite low, uh, quite low uh, range of uh, electron population. So these are like uh, I mean, if we compare it with the player energy, right? So, so these are uh, twenty two. So it ends okay. at twenty four here. Yeah. So it should be somewhere. It's okay. Yeah, around that frequency. Uh -huh. Quite low, quite low energy. Of course, there are uncertainties on this, but overall mean value is around that scale. Right. So uh, so this was the. Uh, uh, this I you know I wanted to sort of like demonstrate how radio wavelengths can be used to NSP type of studies. Now the the second part is about the propagation. Effect. So when the radio waves they propagate, uh, they sort of like get deflected from the from the medium in which they are propagating. So there's a lot of inhomogeneity there. So it it can undergo like refraction scattering type of effect. This will be actually demonstrate how if you if you if you release a, a radio wave packet in the corona. So it will sort of like disperse uh, in this way, and uh, these uh, effects can be sort of like uh, quantified. So, from actually uh, um, PSI mass model, which is basically a, a predictive uh, science uh, modeling tool where provide the uh, real time uh, on that particular day the uh, the, uh, the data for the uh, self constant data for the electron density magnetic field and temperature uh, you can actually build a a simulated model of the the, the corona and this is the simulated model that we obtain assuming the thermal range you can you can model the optical depth of the thermal range column and then you can try to see uh, so at, at high frequency you get a uh, larger correspondence so actually you can, you can see there are like features which are brightly both but at low, low frequency the things are totally different so basically by comparing these two maps you can get a handle on like what are the sort of uh, um, inhomogeneity which is present in the corona uh, which would give rise to such kind of brightness and difference so so for that you need to basically uh, you basically have the optical depth from the from the limb column, then you have the optical depth from the scattering. So it depends on the parameter called epsilon. Uh, epsilon is basically delta n by n, which is basically the temperature change in the in the brightness. 
and uh, you basically fit that into the into the translate version, and then try to try to for some line of sight you try to basically estimate this particular. So, uh, and when we do that uh, for this particular uh, for the central line of sight, we get uh, numbers which are between uh, 0 0.01 to uh, 0.1, which is like uh, 1 percent to 10 percent. So, within this frequency range, one is 1% to 10% type of magnetic in homogeneous is is uh, so stable. Wait, just wait. So these are magnetic or density in this? So these are, uh, so I'm, I'm mixing them at the moment because I'm treating it as a static. So if there are magnetic fields, then I'm assuming that the density also sort of like follows a similar type of in homogeneity. But yeah. So then uh, assuming that these are uh, Density enhanced uh, regions that which you have captured that are also magnetically enhanced. Right. Uh, so these frequencies can be converted into height, right? 120 to 1240. Yeah, yeah. So uh, with height, what would be the height uh, in yeah, solar so, area? Yeah, roughly uh, like 240 megahertz would correspond to uh, like a 0.07 solar radius. 0 0.07. Yeah, 0 0.07 to 0.5. That would be the range. 0 0.07 would be 120. Yeah, no, no, that would be that's 40. Yeah. So then that means your inhomogeneities are decreasing. Uh, I mean, uh, if you are moving up in the solar column. Yeah, so it decreases marginal. So because the error bars are large, I will, I will be a little skeptical to all Because, the, I mean, we were yeah. also doing some, I don't know, but we were uh, studying density inhomogeneity. Right. Um, and uh, from EUV data set, we, along the column of the band, that was what we actually used, right? We, Found that they are actually increasing with height. Yeah. Also because of the expansion of the magnetic flux field, mm -hmm. they can actually go up. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, this this is uh, I mean, one to one height correspondence for the five sun is, is can be a little bit hard because okay. here um, um, you are sampling different uh, range of uh, heights. So so it, the, the the emission is optically different. So you're it, getting average over yeah. similar heights, so yeah. you get a constant. Yeah. Exactly. So so the uh, so the 240 megahertz is dominant for contribution will come from the class of the yeah. system, but there will be a substantial contribution also from the height to the above. So it's relating just uh, one to one to the height would be something which is very simple. So, and yeah. is it possible to do this type of exercise for let's say gigahertz? Yeah, yeah, gigahertz you can do. Uh, uh, because then you will move further into the further into the yeah. 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 You can do, but you need to know your source well because for the Python, um, the other contribution at gigahertz would be arrow resonance. You need to model the arrow resonance of the field ah, instead of the uh, yeah, both you have to do. You can do it. Right. So yeah, so basically, it's um, you you can use Python radio maps to basically um, get an estimate of the magnetic mobility which are in the solar core. Right. And the other uh, part, which is quite relevant for some, oh, okay. So okay. the other uh, um, other part, which is quite prevalent for this, this weather is the CME. Mm -hmm. So you you see uh, quite nicely the CME uh, in in radio, and you can actually see the planes, and you can try to uh, get constraints on the on the on the emission from the plane based on their spectrum. Again, the characteristics of spectrum, so you can. These are the uh, electric the particles which are like uh, trapped in the between the plants of the uh, launch of the CME. So again, you, you can you can do such kind of study to constrain the electron population in this uh, uh, CME. So I'll come to the multivalent part. Uh, I'll put go on to this quickly. So as I said, like the X-ray and radio emissions are sort of like very complementary to each other. They are uh, sort of like the product of the same uh, magnetic field connections which are taking place and one going down, one going up, basically. So we decided to sort of like uh, test it uh, against uh, uh, using uh, X-ray from RST and uh, uh, high frequency, high frequency emission from the ring from one to five gigahertz. You see these, uh, uh, you basically see these bursts, and this is a flare. And uh, corresponding to this burst, you have corresponding uh, X-ray non non thermal X-ray flare peaks. But when we sort of like Image them, they do not lie uh, on on the same same place. So the entire entire process is sort of like sensible, uh, and in the end we conclude that the uh, and, and 
like when, when, when we sort of like constrain the parameters from the X ray and the radio, we find a drastic difference between them. So we conclude that based on the spatial uh, spatial temporal study and the spectral analysis, that these actually come from different uh, electron populations, which are somehow produced uh, from this particular pair in a, in a different way. So that's uh, that. This kind of study you can do with the radio. Then we uh, also did some study, uh, one study with the jets. So there, uh, jets are sort of like uh, they originated from this. Uh, um, uh, eruption of the light bridge over the sunspot, and then you create this uh, spire. We wanted to see where does the uh, uh, the magnetic uh, or the radius source would come from underneath the plasma emission mechanism. So we did some kind of magnetic extrapolation. Uh, from the extrapolation, we find the space some signature of open magnetic field line, and our radius source is uh, at least at high frequency matched with the uh, with this open magnetic field line. So it it, it actually um, uh, is matched. The high frequency at low frequency it does not because there would be scattering and actually okay. So we come up with a picture where uh, the, the there would be a sort of like scape of this electron with the open magnetic field lines from the from uh, the uh, this particular uh, eruption of the, the light bridge. And this is the work which uh, which uh, that the, uh, we are we are doing is basically we're predicting a new uh, type of emission called solar aurora, so we know the aurora boreal is on Earth, we know aurora on Jupiter, but there are uh, aurora on, on, the, on the sun spot actually. So when you have this uh, like a, a conversion magnetic configuration like this, you would, uh, in, in our model, what we, what we detect uh, 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 is the, the clear which is appearing somewhere here and we see the source, radio source here. So there is a clear separation of uh, the distance and when we do the extrapolation, we find a magnetic connectivity from the clear side to the sunspot, and the, the, the magnetic field in the sunspot is converging. So this is sort of like a very facilitating uh, magnetic field configuration for for emission like uh, uh, electron cycle running. And at radio frequency, these are quite persistent. These can last for like uh, many many hours. And uh, by just comparing the fine structures, uh, by by basically um, by comparing the uh, uh, and doing analysis on the fine structures and uh, the power structure analysis, we also find that there is uh, a sort of like involvement of turbulence because we get uh, a turbulent power structure for these emissions. So we come up with this cartoon where the magnetic field sort of like reconnecting here, then there is sort of like particle diffusion, a reservoir where particles are trapped, and the particles are slowly leaking from this reservoir and precipitating on the other rings and creating a uh, uh, radio or uh, at, at this point, and so this is a uh, this is a uh, kind of uh, thing which you can do with high frequency, um, yeah, high frequency uh, radio. Now there are challenges which are which are which are involved in this, um, but uh, many of them uh, can be resolved by more comprehensive data sets. So maybe I'll I'll skip to this a little bit in interest of time because I wanted to focus a little bit on the future missions. So in the future missions, uh, we have we have already have a Parker Solar Probe, which is basically uh, going around the sun now and uh, translating data. Uh, and uh, these are the type field bursts which I was talking about earlier. What kind of uh, uh, data we get is uh, so these type field bursts are sort of like associated with uh, with uh, with the noise storm, and we constrain these type field bursts. Uh, uh, their, their timings to this particular active region here. There is only one active region, and we actually had a, a, a high frequency uh, uh, noise storm in here. So, so basically, the particles are originating here and falling and, and producing these, these, uh, these type of bursts. So, yeah, so such kind of studies uh, also provides the context of, uh, um, of basically studying the space weather because. That you can actually constrain uh, based on the timing information and the location. Again, the solar orbiter is again the second satellite which is orbiting around the sun. It has many many instruments, but uh, the instrument which uh, which uh, which is quite the useful is the UN, which actually gives the unprecedented uh, spatial resolution and uh, allows you to constrain these very small campfires basically. And, uh, and in in, uh, in in X-rays you have these sticks, 
uh, it's, it's, it's basically a imager, just like the rest So you can actually e uh, do the spectrography and the, and the imaging simultaneously. The main uh, problem here is the uh, element problem, is because it is sort of like traveling all around. So it's very hard to to uh, to get large quantities of data from these uh, from these instruments. But these are immensely useful. Uh, and this is the first uh, uh, first picture from the holistics imager. You can see the flare occurring, and then this fixed source is uh, low. This is a low energy source, the red one, and then you see those blue dots, blue dots which you see in the beginning are the high energy ones. So it's quite precise, quite well calibrated now, and uh, you can do uh, spectroscopy and image of the states. The the new thing which will come up from this is uh, basically, since uh, solar orbital and GSP are going around the sun, uh, and we are looking at the flare phenomena from different vantage points, we can do a, some some kind of stereography and build like a 3D model of the of the flare, and that is what uh, we are going to be trying to do with VLA observation and sticks observation. Because uh, if we get a like very very bright flare, then we we can do such kind of activity, and then this 3D picture would allow us to sort of like Constrain many parameters like uh, how many electrons are sort of like going out, how many are precipitating, and what what, what are the things which determine this particular uh, this particular separation. Yeah, so this will be a crucial study for this further. And of course, the uh, the Gal one mission which will will be launched has many many uh, trends course, but for for us, VLC and Zoot, they uh, they are the imaging uh, they are they provide the imaging info uh, the, the location information. And this will be quite crucial for to combine these with uh, with the radio and the X-ray to study uh, the particle excitation features in the solar flare things. Uh, the last one is the solar uh, uh, square perimeter array. So the square perimeter is, is quite wide. It has many many uh, many many science cases in astronomy. But for heliophysics, it has many science cases ranging from uh, fine structures to coronal waves, coronal heating. Uh, and this will actually uh, uh, SKA will enhance our capabilities by by ten times. So it will improve uh, the spatial resolution of the ten times. So it, we can compare directly with UV at uh, at, at mid at, at mid mid frequency and the resolution up to five times. So we can sample uh, new data quite nicely and sensitivity by again by by ten times. So you can will get uh, these type of population which we detect in end of the all the time. Uh, and, but we need to design new techniques to basically do that, and it will be helpful uh, if we can combine this according to the effort of the quality of the quality of the study. So with this, I will leave the uh, the summary. Uh, I just want to say, uh, yeah. So, so feel free to ask any question. Um, and uh, with, with the new instruments, we can do like uh, stereography uh, quite uh, quite nicely, and with the new generation instrument. Uh, we require sort of like a synergy in, in all computing and uh, scientific resources that are present and and also the materials and study that we can and really can be a very good part of it. I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving very nice talk. So now it's time for questions. Feel free to ask. I have a question about the Aurora emission engine. So the Aurora uh, every day sunspot you mentioned. So why do the particles stop at a certain height every day sunspot? Right. So that is one thing I investigated was what is the sort of like stopping length for these particles. So so the the uh, the flare which occurs here it also gives a X-ray signature to Fermi, and from that uh, we get a range of uh, uh, particles, energy non particles which are produced. If you take those uh, non thermal particles and then translate to the uh, stopping lens, uh, we find that they, many of them actually uh, could not even cross the, uh, the top of the loop. But uh, the, the, the particles which are like about 8 kV or so, they can actually go and sort of like stop in this. Uh, so, so, based on the stopping lens, we computed uh, uh, sort of like where should they sort of like mirror. So is it like a magnetic like mirror? Yeah, magnetic mirror effect, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But this is in the turbulent case. Uh, in turbulent case, the stopping length will be even even smaller. 
So you need yeah, a yeah. large amount of uh, energy to transport this particle from here to here. So, and, and and why do you see the radio emission at this uh, uh, position where they, it, it is reversing the direction? Why not at other positions? I mean, why not at yeah. other locations? Yeah, I mean, uh, at, at high frequency, we see a sharp cutoff, mm -hmm. and we attribute that to uh, the particles which cannot go beyond. Okay. If there are, I mean, this is what uh, it is giving us, sort of like uh, the particles are going there, so the, somehow the higher energy particles are not able to sort of like go into these loops. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's, a con there's a constraint we obtain from the, the model. And this effect is uh, related to X class flare mode, but class of mode frequency. Right. So the 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 flare which I am talking about here is a C class flare, but uh, there is a persistent reconnection which is happening here. So which is leading to uh, this reservoir which is always filled. So so there are two types of emission here. One is the continuum emission, which is like this, which is a steady but steady at 20 million Kelvin. And then there are these uh, these pulses on top of it. So this comes from the flare, and this comes from the the reservoir, which is which is which is filled from the, the constant reconnection, which has happened here. And that's the model. In the slides 30 and 31, you have mentioned about the spectral window versus the timing, and the temperature versus timing. Yeah. So this. These two plots. So basically, here we have three different peaks here. So people can be easily confused by the RFIs also uh, in this uh, because the RFIs also have the similar kind of peaks in the radio, radio Yeah, I mean, so uh, if you see the previous picture, previous slide, the spectral yeah. window plot. So how can you uh, say that that this is the pure uh, emission coming from the sun and this is uh, only coming from the RFI? Yeah, so RFI in MWK case is, is, is quite low. Uh, it is already uh, always restricted to the frequency band. Um, so the frequency channels can be flat. So that is how we sort of like remove it. That is good enough. Uh, apart from that, uh, RFIs are, of course, um, one cannot totally rule out, but RFIs will not produce uh, such persistent uh, uh, sort of like a, a, a one, one person signal. So it will be much, much stronger as compared to the sun. Okay, sometimes there is some frequency variation in the RFI zone. Right, so but we are talking about only very narrow frequency. Like, yeah, maybe that's the case. Yeah, any further questions? So uh, the energy you are saying in the first image. So uh, are, are, uh, these, uh, you are saying that these energies are comparable to peak of flare. Right. Okay. So can we uh, can we say something about uh, how how much they are contributing to commutation as uh, they are holding the commutation slope? <laughs> yeah, I mean the slope is about two uh, minus. Yeah, it's at borderline. <laughs> borderline. <laughs> but <laughs> if it is less than two, then yeah, of course it yeah. is. Uh, I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I just I computed this just to get a feel at the moment. But uh, the problem is like uh, uh, this. This has uh, some assumptions which are like uh, uh, what is the efficiency factor of uh, um, of the non-thermal electron, or what is the different of, of the ratio of non-thermal electron to the electron total electron population. Those are not variable constraints. So I, here we assumed a, 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 a sort of a nominal value from the simulation. And the simulations can be sort of like, uh, they may not be real, right? So, uh, so there is a large uncertainty for this, but certainly what we find is, a, is this slow at the moment, um, but uh, this would be needed to do one more number of data sets would be cut off. But this is just for the demonstration. But because that can be compared with what we get in UI time for the Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was our initial idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the, this paper came before, so that came that paper came up. But but that, but these energies are uh, much much smaller than uh, the other time yeah, because those were compared to nano I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, 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 I think that they, they, they will not be comparable. Um, those would be higher because these, yeah, yeah, they're not mm -hmm. these are also much higher of which are happening um, in, in high corona 
But yeah, this is another something I wanted to ask. At what height uh, do you see these? Yeah, so these would be um, quite uh, like the some point one point two solar radii. I would say point two solar radii. So about uh, yeah, out like uh, much uh, higher than these. Yeah. So it will be um, you know, if you look at the magnetic canopy, it is much much higher than this. Yeah. Much much higher than magnetic canopy. So yeah, I mean the um, the, the heights will change yeah. depending on the. We cannot really estimate directly. Uh, one height, but mm -hmm. we can say that it is based on their frequency. Uh, yeah. But the low frequency, this one is around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 solar radius. So this is huh. this burst, which occurs, is, is mm -hmm. much higher. And this histogram uh, for, for pl uh, I mean, can, uh, plotting the histogram, we took into all the heights. Yeah, all, all, all the features. All the across the. All the Any other question? Okay, if not, then let us turn to Rohit again. <laughs> you can, uh, I'm available. Yeah, he's around also. And uh, you guys are also are here, so he will be available for schedule and doing and other things. He's also here tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow uh, morning. Tomorrow morning.